Hello and welcome and congratulations on grabbing access to this video course on WordPress search engine optimization. This is video number one and we're going to begin with the introduction and the quick overview. So are you ready to understand how to make your ranking stick and understand the fundamentals that don't necessarily change? Now, before we do that, I want to talk about mindset because I'm a big believer that if you're in the right mindset before you implement this process, then your likelihood of speeding up the process and doing it successfully is higher. Now, a lot of marketing strategies come and go. The ones that are often the ones that stay and stick are boring and overlooked, and that's why they are overlooked. So just keep that in mind that as long as you're willing to do what is boring and cons constantly think about how to make your users experience a good one, everything else is going to follow. So now what I want to do is give you a quick overview of the video course itself. So you know exactly what to expect. And that way, when you implement the process, it'll just make more sense. This is video number one, video number two, we're going to talk about the intent of a keyword. Now, the reason why we want to do this before we get the keywords is because a lot of people, generally speaking, they'll type it in a keyword tool, they'll get a bunch of keywords, and then they'll just begin to try to rank on them. That is a big mistake. And the reason being is because if you don't know why somebody typed in a keyword, where they are in the process of buying, whether they're researching, whether they're comparing, whether they really don't know what they're buying or if they do know what they're buying, it's going to be a lot easier to convince them. So knowing the intent of a keyword is crucial. Third, we're going to talk about getting keywords and understanding LSI. And I'll talk more about that acronym in that particular video. But at this point in time, we're going to get keywords and we are going to be using a free tool. Video number four, we're going to talk about on-page optimization basics. Unfortunately, a lot of people miss out on optimization in terms of their website itself, such as how do you make your website search engine friendly so that when the search engine comes to your website, they know exactly what you are talking about. And video number five, we're going to talk about WordPress on page optimization. So from video four, I talk about the fundamentals video number five, we are going to do some implementation. So you learn it and then we are going to implement it. All right. Video number six, we're going to talk about creating LSI content so that Google knows what your content is all about. And therefore it's more likely going to rank you higher as long as you're not spammy. So, what we're trying to do is we're trying to appease primarily the human being that is reading the content, but in doing so you will please the search engines as well. We're not talking about black hat tactics here or gaming the system or anything like that. We're talking about long-term strategies. So video number seven, we're going to talk about on page consistency with WordPress plugins. And I'm going to talk about some plugins that we have tested and we have found that work well with our results. Some plugins have come and gone. There's a particular one that I have found that has really, really done well across the board. And then I'm going to throw in a bonus in video number eight, and we're going to talk about high authority backlinks, where to go to get them, why high authority backlinks are more important than just a bunch of backlinks. So you see back in the day, you could throw a hundred backlinks at a site and get it ranked and not so much nowadays, but this is more of a long-term strategy and this works now and most likely will work in the end, as long as you do not do it in a black hat manner. So that's that. And the next thing I want to do is talk about things you need to get started. Now, obviously you're not going to need to have any tools because everything else is free aside from the domain and everything like that. But with the domain, the web hosting that does cost money aside from that, WordPress is free. 
Aside from that, all the tools that we're going to be using is free too. But before you can actually figure out the intent of a keyword, you really need to figure out what are you selling? Are you selling your own product? Are you selling somebody else's product? What are you selling? Is it a service? Is it a product? What is it? And number two, who are you selling to? I really want you to begin to paint a picture of who that might be because you don't really want to necessarily please everybody. You want to please the person who is what we call a buyer who really, really wants that product. All right. So who are you selling to? What do they look like? All of that. If you can figure all that, just a general point of view from their perspective, we can then move on to video number two. And with video number two, we're going to talk about the intent of a keyword. And I'll talk more about that in that video. Welcome back. This is video number two, and we are going to talk about the intent of a keyword. So before you go out and you grab a bunch of keywords, stop and wait. And the reason being is because the biggest mistake that people make is in this process is not really knowing where your buyer is within the buyer's cycle. So really what you want it to do is when you look at a keyword, you want to think, why is somebody typing in this keyword? Are they researching? Are they comparison shopping or are they buying? So that's really what it comes down to. Are they looking around? Do they really know what they're buying? Maybe they don't know what they're buying yet. And you got to get them to the point of researching, comparing, and then buying, right? If you think about the buyer cycle, if somebody doesn't really know what they're looking for, they might type in the keyword, how to stop blank. If they're researching, they might do brand name versus brand name. Or if they're actually looking to buy the product, then they might type in your product name or the product model number. You might see some keywords out there where somebody is searching for a specific model number. Let's say for example, for an appliance or they're looking for parts. And the reason they're doing that is because if they're searching very, very specifically, they're more likely going to buy, right? So if you can think about that, then when you get them to your website and you get them to your articles, your content, your videos and everything like that, then guess what? You've set yourself up for success. So in other words, different keywords can mean different things and not understanding where your buyer is within that process can set you up for failure. Now this can change depending on which article they land on, like I said earlier. So creating your content based on the intent of the keyword is crucial. So I really want you to kind of think about that before you go out and begin to really start digging up keywords and doing keyword research, using keyword tools or anything like that. It doesn't matter if you're using a paid keyword tool or a free keyword tool, same thing. Understanding the intent of your direction is crucial. So if your site mainly is trying to sell stuff right off the bat, and you might want to target mainly buyer keywords or keywords where people are comparison shopping you versus your competitor. And then of course you can go from that point and then drill deep deeper and dig on keywords that are related to somebody who is not necessarily knowing uh, what they're looking for. So now that we have gotten that out of the way, now you understand that now that you're thinking about it, you're more likely to succeed and you're more likely to be able to create content that will convert. Now let's talk about the fundamentals and move on to video number three. Welcome back. This is video number three. And now that you understand the buyer keyword intent, it's time to go ahead and get some keywords and we'll talk about understanding LSI as well so that when you begin to look for keywords, you can look for similar keywords, which is basically what LSI is all about. So LSI stands for latent semantic 
indexing. It's just another fancy name of similar keywords. So what I want to do before we go out and search for keywords is to give you some examples of LSI. So as you know, Google sends out a robot or a computer that tries to read and understand what is on your page. So if you understand this concept and you can help Google out, then most likely it'll categorize you in the right area. So for example, Google has a way of, to know if the keywords you're using actually relate to each other. So they can see if one keyword is relational to another keyword or if you're keyword spamming or you're trying to game the system. So that's why if you really look through this, you realize that it really comes down to not just using the right keywords, but really appealing to a human being. If you appeal to the human being, then you will appeal to Google in the long term because essentially what you're doing is you're providing quality, right? So what you're trying to do is you're trying to help Google paint a picture of what you're talking about. And that's what their robot is designed to do. So let's, let's just take an example here. Everybody has, you know, lives in an apartment or house or somewhere. So let's talk about roofs. Imagine writing an article about roof repair. So if you use the word, say for example, shingle, nails, a specific type of shingle, maybe a metal shingle, uh, we could talk about gutters. Google knows at that point that the word shingle, the word nail, and the word roof and the repair, Google knows that you're talking about roof repair because they have a massive dictionary of words that have, they're able to see the relationships between each word. So in that case, Google knows what you're talking about. And if you're talking about, if you just try to keyword spam it like roof repair, roof repair, roof repair, Google's going to know that as well. And they're going to know that you're trying to gain the system. And that's really not going to be appealing as much to a real live human being. Another thing that we're not really going to go into too much about, but if you can get a human being to stay on your website for a long period of time, and in other words, engage with your content, then you're going to get a higher ranking with Google. So what we call that being a higher stick rate, a higher engagement rate can actually help you out as well. So actually you'll see nowadays that the longer your content, the better. Or if you create a video, videos actually create a higher stick rate and higher engagement rate as well. So with that said, now let's go ahead and find some keywords. So going back to video number two, if you really think about the intent of the keyword in relation to the content on your website, at this point in time, I generally speaking will use two websites. Now, number one, if I try to figure out, okay, the buyer is in the researching phase or in the comparison phase, or maybe they don't even really know what they're looking for, Google is a great resource to start with. And then as far as the buyer, actual marketplaces are really good places to find buyer keywords. So for example, Amazon would be a good place to go. Now you'll realize in just a minute that I'm not really using any keyword tool. What I'm using is what we call the suggested keywords. Now, in order for the suggested keywords to show up in Google or Amazon, that means that there must be a high volume of people searching for it. So if you go to Google, for example, you know how you type in a keyword, let's say, for example, how to repair a roof. And when you do that, you can see that Google gives you a list of suggestions. So we can see how to repair a roof leak, leak around events, or roof truss. Now we know off the bat that these are highly searched. Now, if there are any relation to your business, then these are great words to use. Now let's say, for example, how to repair a roof leak. At this point in time, if you scroll 
all the way down to the bottom, you'll also see other related searches. So how to repair a roof leak yourself from the inside around a vent on a mobile home, how to repair a roof leak on a camper from the inside, the costs and flat roof leak repair. So if you're finding that, okay, this one actually relates to my product or service and you click on it, you can jot those keywords down, do the same thing. You can take a look at these keywords and these are showing the suggested keyword that you want. So what you can do is you can simply highlight these like so and simply copy these the text and paste that into your notepad. Now there are tons and tons and tons of other keywords, but these are great keywords to start out with. Now, generally speaking, what I like to do is I like to use these as article titles. Now, if you dig a lot deeper and you look at particular articles that are surrounding these particular titles, or if you take these long tail keywords or long phrase keywords and you put them into your favorite keyword tool, whether that be Google Planner or another keyword tool, that keyword tool will generally speaking will give you a larger list of keywords that are related. And those are what we call LSI keywords or latent semantic keywords or keywords that are actually related to the direct main keyword. So again, if I'm doing any type of keyword researching and I'm looking for somebody who is researching or they're comparison shopping, I'll type that in here. I'll look at these. I'll pick and choose from these, create these as titles, and then I'll plug these into something like Google Keyword Planner. And then I'll get a list of detail keywords and use those lists of keywords. You don't have to use all of them, but use some of them inside of your article content, whether that be your written content or your video content. Now, a really, really great way to get rankings is using the same method that I showed you here, title, and then a list of keywords from Google Keyword Planner or your favorite keyword tool, and then write the article and then make a video about it, and then upload it to YouTube but in addition to that, upload the transcript or get somebody to transcribe it and upload it as well. And then that way YouTube knows that your video has latent semantic indexing keywords inside of it or related keywords inside of it. And that will actually boost your ranking as well. So that's what I do when I try to find keywords for the basic researching and comparison. Now, I like to use Amazon when it comes to products that we actually want to sell. Now, obviously Amazon does not have all of the products and services. You can use something like eBay, and if you don't find anything, you can also use Google as well. But as you know, if you go to Amazon, let's type something in here like roof repair. And right off the bat, Amazon begins to suggest RV roof repair, roof repair with tape, sealant, camper roof repair, and roof repair spray. Now, remember, we actually saw the camper roof repair in Google as well. So if we take a look at here, this gives us some ideas about what, what keywords people are using. You can even look at the ratings, the negatives and the positives and see what kind of language people who buy this actually use so that you can use those same terminology and language to speak to them. Because otherwise, if you don't speak their language, they'll feel like, wait a minute, you're not really, you know, maybe are you legitimate? So you really want to make sure that you speak their language, speak to them and their needs. And what better way to do that than using Amazon.com or paid marketplaces. Welcome to video number four. We're going to talk about on-page optimization 
basics. So in this particular video, we're going to talk about the fundamentals and the concepts. And then of course, in video number five, once you have learned this, we will begin to implement everything that I teach you. So once you have understand LSI and you've gotten your keywords, it's time to understand how on-page optimization works. Let's discuss your domain name. Should you use brand names or keyword names? There's a really big debate around this and sometimes keyword names work and sometimes brand names work. Now, this is what we found, however, and you kind of want to look at it at a long-term view because if you do something now that might work, and if you do something that is essentially kind of on that gray line of gaming the system, then even though it works now, three years later, Google will come with a Google slap and it'll slap you off the face of the top 10. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to stick with something that is consistent, something that is long-term and that will actually work. Now, obviously we don't know the future, but we can look at the past and in the last decade and see what has come and gone. Now, Google is actually moving away from domains that are gaming the system. They absolutely love brand names. They absolutely love high authority sites. Now, here's what I mean by a brand name. Keyword names or keyword stuff domains are not really good. And what that means is, let's say, for example, we want to stick with the theme roof repair. So we can say roof repair city state dot com. And you'll actually see a lot of websites that are that particular domain name. So that's what we call keyword stuff domains. And there's nothing wrong with that necessarily, but you'll see in just a minute what will happen. Brand names are obviously some sort of brand name that has either has something to do with a keyword or it does not have to. So let's say, let's say for example, Coca-Cola, there's no dictionary word for Coca-Cola, except for that. We know Coca-Cola produces Coke as in soda. And we know in the dictionary, that's a brand name. So Google tends to like those and I'll show you in a minute why. So let's say, for example, www.roofrepaircitystate.com. You're going to see a lot of that, but here's the complications. If you create a category such as, for example, roof, and then you create a page that is roof repair, then if you look at it, you can see that there is a lot of repetitive keywords in here and Google does not really like to see repetitive keywords. Because to them, that is like keyword stuffing and keyword spamming. And maybe that's something that you could get away with a decade ago, but not necessarily nowadays. Now let's take an example of a brand name. So let's say for example, the brand name of this roof repair company is called maybe the happy shingle or something, or, or the red shingle or something. If you think about that and it doesn't have the word roof in it or repair, then it's not keyword spammy. So if it says the red shingle.com slash roof slash repair. Now that is nice because it's not repeating the keyword over and over. So if in the future, Google decides to change, Yes, it does work now. And I will say it still works now, but if Google decides to change and say that any type of keyword stuffing in the domain itself can harm you, then you're kind of at a loss. So that's just something to keep in mind at that point. Now I want to talk about URL structures within WordPress itself you have something called permalinks and this gives you the option to basically make your URLs more search engine friendly or even human friendly. And what I would do is I would choose the post name option and I'll show you what that looks like and how to go about doing that in video number five. 
But for now, I just want to tell you right off the bat, you don't want your domain to look like this, www.yourdomain.com slash something like 1232 slash 3323, or even question mark 123 equals 123. You definitely don't want your domain to look like that. And it looks like that by default. So within WordPress, you want to set the post name option. And by doing that, this is what's going to happen. It's going to say yourdomain.com slash category slash keyword dash title. So I will show you all of that in the next video, but I want to make sure that you understand these basics. So domain, try to stick with a brand name and then choose the post name option within WordPress. So what are things that stay consistent? And I know this is one of the questions that a lot of people ask, and this is something that is a good question because what does and what has stayed consistent? Well, most of the above has stayed the same except for the brand name slash keyword domain name kind of thing. But it's inevitable, and if you think about it, if you're branding your company and you're building an actual company with a brand that has an identity, then as Google looks at your brand name and looks at the content you put out, it begins to put a name to a face. So as you can see, the most of the above has stayed the same. Now, what are things that have changed that you need to be aware of? Like we said earlier, brand names versus keyword stuff domains are changing. So even though keyword stuff domains do work nowadays and you could do it if you wanted to, uh, but just keep in mind, those are things that are changing. So really what it comes down to, if you really think about it, try to avoid gaming the system. If you game the system and you kind of pull away from being hu human friendly, then that's when things can actually begin to hurt you. So just keep in mind, as I stated earlier in the mindset section, as long as you make things human friendly and you strive to engage with your visitors and get them to engage back, that's where you will begin to rank better. So bottom line, if you have to ask, what am I going to help my visitors are not. What am I doing? Am I doing something that is helping them? Great, keep doing it. Or am I doing something that is actually annoying them or hurting them? Don't do it. So that's kind of a question that you can look into. So with that said, let's move on to video number five. And I'm gonna talk about WordPress on-page optimization. And we're gonna jump on to a real live WordPress site so I'm going to assume that you know how to install WordPress and you have a WordPress site. So assuming that that is the base condition, I'm going to start from scratch where we have just installed a brand new WordPress install. And I'll walk you through step by step everything that we talked about in this particular video. Hello and welcome to video number five. We are going to talk about WordPress on page optimization and we are going to do everything that we discussed in video number four and that will be implemented here. So we'll be discussing the URL structuring categories as well as site structure. So with that said, I assume that you will have a WordPress site available. So if you want to go ahead and log in and follow me along or watch till the end and follow later, that's fine. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and log in to a live WordPress site and I'll walk you through step by step. So right now I have logged into my WordPress administrator dashboard. And I want to say that if you don't have WordPress installed, it's super easy. If you have any problems, just contact your web hosting company and they'll typically point you to a software application that will install the WordPress site really, really fast within less than three steps. So get that site up and running, log into your WordPress administrator 
link, which that install typically will provide you with. Uh, but if not, you can always go to yourdomain.com slash wp-admin. So that's how to get here. And once you have logged in, you want to go under settings right here. So you're not going to be able to see these, but you will see settings. So click on settings and then go to permalinks. So permalinks, as I stated earlier in the previous video, this will allow you to make your URL structure more search engine friendly and human friendly as well. So they know exactly where they are at. So as you can see by default, it shows the slash question mark P equals one, two, three. Now that's not human friendly and that's not search engine friendly at all. What you want to do is you want to choose post name and then all you need to do is click on save changes. The next thing I want to show you how to do is how to create categories because you want to make sure that you categorize your content, you categorize your pages and categorize your posts. Now all you need to do is under posts, as you can see here, you can see categories. So if you go to categories and there's tags as well, and you can add the category name, the slug is basically a URL friendly version of the name. So let's say for example, your name of the category was a two word. So if we say something like metal roof, the slug will be all lowercase. So you type in metal dash roof and that just makes it SEO friendly. And then of course I would add a description if you could. And another thing is utilize the LSI keywords that you grabbed earlier and enter them in here. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to make it really, really search engine friendly as well as human friendly as well. And of course, if you have parent categories, you can create parent and child categories as well. Now, what I want to do right here is talk about site structure. So now you know permalinks, now you know categories. What you generally speaking want to do before you actually go out and create your content is to figure out the different categories of your content or how you can split up your site and structure your site in such a way where the search engines know what category is what. So what I would do is this, and I'm creating a kind of a flow chart here so that you can visually see it better. So I would have a category here, another category here, and another category here. So depending on how many categories that you want. Now, if you think back at the keyword intent and the buyer cycle, remember we have the buyer doesn't really know what they're looking for. So they're, they're currently researching and then the buyer knows kind of what they're looking for. So they're looking at different brand names and then maybe you have a category filled with buyers or buying. And of course you can split this up further if you would like to. But if you really think about it, if you start placing your content that is related to maybe researching how to repair this, how to repair that, just kind of information and article content that is helpful, but allows your customers or your prospects to make a better decision. And then comparing, maybe you can compare your product and service versus another competing product or service. You can name them or you don't have to name them, but you want to pinpoint things that your prospects are really thinking about. And then of course, buying articles that relate directly to buying, how to get them to take action, uh, how to maybe get them to sign up for a freebie in return for their email address to build a lead magnet. So this could be buying or this could be, you know, getting people on your list. Now, apart from this, you also want to think about categories like categorization of roofs, maybe metal roofs, maybe ceramic roofs, maybe uh, tin roofs, maybe specific types of things also need to be categorized as well. So obviously your content or your page and post 
would be underneath that category. So you want to make sure that you do something like this and do the same thing under here and under here as well. So maybe you want to use these as tags and then you want to use the categories as such uh, different types of roofs, different types of repairs and everything like that. So if you do this, it's easier if you map it out first and then you could go under here, you can create the categories. You can also go to tags and create tags as well. And tags will allow you to connect content. So for example, if, a bunch of piece of content were related to you know researching or, or even comparison charts you could have that and have the content that have comparison charts or comparisons in them tagged in there so if somebody's doing comparison research and they're trying to compare everything they'll be easily able to find those different comparison charts and what they're looking for and you just basically you're helping people make a better decision but at the same time you're connecting your content to each other to help the search engines understand uh, the relationships between your content and your keywords and everything like that so and later on in the future videos i will show you how to create content and how to grab those lsi keywords and everything like that but for now you understand the overall structure and now you can fill in the structure with content and everything else all right, so let's move on to the next video. Hello and welcome back. This is video number six and we are going to talk about creating LSI content or keyword and search engine friendly content. So a site without content is nothing. So we talked about site structure in the previous video. We're going to talk about filling it in with content. So the big question is how should you write your articles or blog content to ensure that it is SEO optimized or search engine friendly. So it's going to actually be super easy to do. But what we're going to do is we're going to take the list of keywords that you got from earlier. And let me show you how easy this is. So before we can create the content, I want to show you a specific method to create the content structure. So if you think about it, we're focusing a lot on structure because once you create the structure, filling in the structure is actually very, very quick and easy. So same thing here. Finding the titles is, as I stated earlier in the video where we talked about the Google keyword suggested keywords, what we need to do is up at the top, I'm going to type in how to find a roof leak. So before we can talk about how to repair a roof leak, we need to find the roof leak. So I'm essentially helping the buyer progress through finding it, repairing it, and maybe I sell some sort of product that is related to roof leaks, but I have to get them to the buying point and the trust part before I can actually sell to them, right? So how to find a roof leak could be our title. And let me just open up notepad here and enter that here. So that could be our title. And if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see the searches related to how to find a roof leak. So if we take a look at the keywords here and we're going to highlight it and copy, and then I'm going to go ahead and copy it over to notepad here. So if you copy it, we can see it's all here. So it says how to find a roof leak on a flat roof. We've got mobile home, how to find a roof leak with no attic from the outside on a tile roof on a RV. And of course, how to stop it. So of course that is actually the progression. So finding it first is crucial and then stopping it could be the call to action. So the question is, how do you want to get people from one step to the next step, right? So once you find the roof leak, you want to stop it. How do you go about stopping it? So the call to action could redirect people from this state of mind 
to how to stop it. Of course, how to find it, we could, these could be our bullet points right here. Because these are different scenarios. And we know down here that these are highly searched because they appear down here. And all we need to do now is create an article about how to find a roof leak. Now, if you want to get really, really specific, you could use all of these and turn these into titles. Now, you could create this as one article. So a general how to find a roof leak. Or you can also use one of these, such as how to find a roof leak in a mobile home. So obviously these are different scenarios and different scenarios. If you have a specific article for these scenarios, uh, you will essentially be talking directly to that person. So how to find a roof leak in a mobile home. You could actually copy this whole thing and you could go to the Google Keyword Planner tool. If you don't know how to get there, you can go to Google and you can type in Google Keyword Planner, as you can see here. So we're going to sign in. And all you need to do is go to the search for new keywords using a phrase, because we got a phrase. Click that, enter the phrase in here. You can also enter a landing page, but we're not really doing any of that right now. We're going to go ahead and you can select category if you would like to. But all we have to do in this case is do that. And typically I leave these blank and see what I get. And I don't, if I don't get a lot, then I'll go back over here. But we're going to go ahead and click get ideas. And Google AdWords is now doing a search for this particular phrase here. Now, if you scroll down, it says mobile home repair, mobile home roofing, roof coating, everything to do with mobile home roofs. Now, obviously, you need to pay close attention to these because some of these may not necessarily be related to your article content, but some of them are. So typically what I like to do is I like to download the ideas and We'll download it as a Excel spreadsheet. We'll save the file. And then let's go ahead and open the file right now. So if we look for the keywords here, it's this one here. And I'm just going to go ahead and delete these so that you can, you're able to see everything clearly. And let's go ahead and maximize the screen a bit. All right, so as you can see here, obviously you have a lot of different keywords and we don't necessarily need to have all of these keywords, but typically I'll pick about a few of these, maybe 10 of these, and then I'll make sure that they're actually within inside of my article content. Now, as you can see, it says mobile home, mobile home, mobile home. You have to be careful about repeating your keywords way too much. So what you want to do is you will probably want to go with roofing, roof coating, roof over, sealer, replacement, and the keyword that is all the way at the very end, such as repair, sealing, leak, repair, vents. You want to make sure that these words are within your article. And if these words are in your article, you actually have a better chance of ranking your article content. So if we go back to here, we can look at the article content and the keywords will actually be what we pulled just now. I would make sure that they're within your article content. It doesn't really matter where they are. It just matters that they're inside of your article content. And what I would do is I would create the article or you can even give it to an article writer and you can get a proofreader as well. So what I typically like to do is if you're on a time crunch and you have more money than time, then obviously you can go hire somebody. If you have more time and you don't have as much money and you're on a tight budget, then of course you will need to write the article yourself. But you can go to a site called fiverr.com and that is F-I-V-E-R-R.com and all you have to do is enter the service so you can write in here proofreader 
And once you have a good proofreader here, then you can actually get them to proofread for you. And this guy is actually a really, really good guy to go to. And if you go to article writer, and sometimes he's not available. So what I typically do is I like to go to up to 24 hours. So I, I typically like to find somebody who can do it quick. And then I, I look for the one who has the most reviews. And then of course you want to pay close attention to how many words that they will actually edit for you. So uh, most of them will only do 1000 words. So if your article is longer than that, you want to make sure that you find somebody like this who will edit up to 5,000 words. All right. Even 3000 words here, but I would pay close attention to how many reviews that they have. Cause I want somebody who is serious and I want somebody who can have a quick turnaround time. You can also type in the keyword article writer and same thing delivery time. I don't really mind too much about that, uh, but you'll have to log in to actually s buy from these people. But Typically, I like to do seller language is English. So I definitely want their first language to be English. So I want to check either one of these two. Level one or two are good sellers. That means that they have higher ratings. They have higher feedback. They have a good reputation. In that way, you get somebody like that. Typically, I'll find a few and I'll try to send it to a few of these. And I'll see which one has the best article. And then I'll stick with them. And then of course you can find a videographer to take that article and then maybe make something visual so that you can upload it to YouTube. Welcome to video number seven. We're going to talk about on page consistency via WordPress plugins. Now in video number five, we talked about site structure. In video number six, we talked about filling that structure with content. Now, before you actually add those content to your posts or your pages, you want to make sure that you install a specific WordPress plugin called Yoast. And Yoast SEO is a plugin that we actually tested. We have gotten better results with Yoast than the other WordPress plugins. And this is, has been actually been going on for many, many years. So what I want to do in this particular video is show you how to install Yoast SEO, what settings you should use, because there's all sorts of different settings and other settings within your WordPress site to make sure that your site is going to be search engine friendly. And once you've installed Yoast, the nice thing is that you don't really have to tweak anything else again, once you have set everything up and it's done. All right. So let me show you how to do that. Now, before we go out and we install the Yoast SEO plugin, I want to say that before doing that, you want to head on over to the writing section and under the update services, you're going to see one ping URL. So what this is, is that you want to do this when it comes close to the time that you begin to create posts and pages so that you can alert the search engines that, Hey, I've got new content. So what you want to do up into this point is click on update services and they're going to give you a list of URLs. So all you have to do is simply highlight that we're going to copy it and head back over here, delete that and paste that in here and click on save changes. So that's what I would do. And the next thing I would do is when you click on reading here and you scroll all the way down to the bottom, you're going to see search engine visibility. I would check this if you are not ready to be released to the public. So if you're not ready for the search engines to index you or to come to you and say, Hey, I'm a new site. I've got all this content. I would check this now up until the time when you are ready to start posting and adding content, then I would deselect that. All right. So that's typically what I like to do. So that way, when they come to your site, when you have a lot of content, they're like, wow, I've discovered a new site with all this content. I'm going to index you properly. So those are the two things that I like to do before 
we install Yoast. Now let's go ahead and install Yoast SEO. And what we need to do is go to plugins, go to add new, and then under search plugins, we are going to search for Yoast. So just type in Y O A S T and you're looking for Yoast SEO, this one here. So you could also type in Yoast SEO, but this is the one that is going to be from team Yoast. It's got 1 million active installs, highly popular plugin. So just go ahead and click on Yoast, install now, click on activate plugin. And in a matter of seconds, typically you'll be good to go. Now it says huge SEO issue. You're blocking access to robots. So you must go to the reading settings and uncheck the search engine visibility. So yeah, we know that and we did that for a reason because we are purposely blocking the robots for now until we get our Yoast settings up and running. So once we do that, uh, just make sure that you go back up over here and uncheck it. So the nice thing about Yoast is it does allow us to be notified uh, to as a reminder to uncheck that. So now what we want to do is we want to go to SEO. You go to general and we've got a help center. We don't really need to go here, but we can go to your info. And as you can see here, we can enter the website name. Uh, typically what you want to do is you want to name it your brand name and maybe a dash and then maybe kind of uh, overall main keyword that you want to rank on. You can also enter the alternate name here and you want to choose if you're a company or a person. Uh, this will allow Google to get a better read on you if you're a company or a person. So if you're a company, you know, enter the name of your company and then of course upload a logo and try to fill in as much detail as possible. If you're a person, then of course enter your name here. And then of course you can go to Webmaster Tools and you can use these boxes below to verify, you know, different webmaster tools. So we got Alexa, Bing, Google search and Yandex. And of course you have security. Now the specific settings, the titles and metas are important. So if we go here and we go to homepage, uh, typically I like to leave this as it is post types. We have templates. Now, what this means is that every time you create a post or page, the title will show up, the page and the site name will show up as well. So if you only want the title to show up, you can always delete all of this. But typically I like to leave everything as they are because uh, they've done a lot of testing to know what works and what doesn't really work. So meta robots, we can index it. And that just means that they'll come to the site and index your site. And meta box, I'll leave that as it is. Uh, meta description allows you to kind of uh, customize the description of every page, every post, and all your media. So what this does, it also allows you to make your media search engine friendly as well. So we leave taxonomies alone. We typically leave everything alone, uh, but you can always customize it further if you would like. And then of course we have social optimization. So if you do have a Facebook page URL, it's a good idea to enter them here uh, specifically because Google likes to know that if you are a brand name, that you have other social properties that could possibly be looking to you. And if you can enter Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and your other URLs here. And of course you can customize it further as well. Next we have XML sitemaps and you can expand the number of entries per sitemap, but 1000 is a good amount. Uh, so you don't really need as much more than that. Then you have post types, excluded posts and taxonomies. Then of course we have the advanced section, which we have the ability to create breadcrumbs and make our permalinks a lot more search engine friendly if we want to. So in all in all, typically I leave them as they are, but I'm just going through here to show you that you can tweak things when you want to. Now, once you have installed the Yoast SEO plugin, I wanted to show you this, but after 
after you create new pages, when you enter the title here, the body of the posts, if you scroll down, you'll be able to see Yoast SEO, and this will allow you to change the settings for every specific article. So right now, obviously there's nothing here, but if we enter the title in the description, this will automatically change here. You can enter the focus keywords, particularly for that. And what's nice about Yoast is it will analyze your content as you can see here. So it'll tell you upon looking at your content and analyze your content, it'll give you kind of a overview of how that looks like to the search engines. So that's why I like Yoast really, really well because it gives you so much data to go off of and it makes your site really search engine. So from our testing, we found that Yoast was actually very, very good. So obviously once you are ready, once you have created your first content piece, then of course go up here and deselect the search engine visibility like this so that you can get the search engines back to your site. And then every time you create a post or a page, it will ping those ping sites, which will then get search engines back as well. All right, so I hope you enjoyed this particular video. As you can see, it's not really hard. Just do those two settings that I talked about earlier. Install Yoast SEO. You can keep them as they are, the settings wise, and that's it. So congratulations, you have reached the end of this video course. This is video number eight, and this is gonna be a bonus, and this is gonna be about authority backlinks. And basically, now that you have gotten your uh, basic on-page SEO down, well, let's talk a little bit about off-page search engine optimization. So back in the day, you could literally just throw a bunch of backlinks and it would work. But nowadays, you kind of have to be careful about the backlinks that are pointing to you because Google will pay close attention to these. So that's a good question. What types of backlinks should you avoid and which ones should you actually focus on? So gone are the days where you could throw a bunch of backlinks, hundreds and hundreds of backlinks on a website and it would rank. In fact, if you have that right now, it's probably hurting your site. So here's what we want to do. Google pays close attention to high authority backlinks. And what I mean by that is high authority websites and social properties such as YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and any large social network, especially like networks that are related to your theme. So even LinkedIn. So getting a direct backlink from these sites is actually very, very good. Now let's say this, for example, is your site and we'll call this the money site because this is where people buy from you. This is where you sell to them. So you definitely want to get links from here and it doesn't really matter. This can be anywhere from like your YouTube channel profile those are good high quality backlinks you can you can also get social shares as well so we can call these social shares or any type of social backlink pointing to your money site now you can still get backlinks from other sources as well but if you do any type of other link generally speaking what we like to do is we like to you know if we got like article links or web 2.0 links or anything like that. But we like to do what we call tier two links. And these links can be, you know, social bookmarking, web 2.0, even article links too, forum profile links. And what we like to do is we like to link these directly to these social properties. So it's actually better to get a bunch of backlinks and link them to a high authority site rather than linking them directly to your money site. So back in the day, you could just you know, buy a bunch of backlinks and point them right here. And not necessarily nowadays. 
that you want to make sure that they're themed. But if you do get a lot of backlinks, just link them to your social properties. Because in Google's eyes, because YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter are so big anyways, you know, you got so many links linking to these sites, this will actually boost your YouTube channel, your Facebook channel, or Twitter page, or YouTube videos. And then from those properties, you link directly to your money site. Now, there are some cases where you could link directly to your money site uh, from these social properties. And a high authority site, you know, will link directly to here. Now, some sites can link directly to your money site, uh, but you wanna make sure that you also check, are they themed correctly? Are they related to your site? If they are related, great. If they're not directly related, then you might want to check a site called Majestic. And there's a tool called Majestic.com, which allows you to take a look at a specific URL and get an idea about the trust flow, like authority and trust. And if you realize that Google no longer really pays close attention to Google page rank, so I won't even go there, but now they pay close attention to authority and trust. How much a site has authority wise and how much trust that site has. So for example, if we type in youtube.com, this obviously is gonna have a higher trust and authority. But just to give you a glimpse, it takes a look at trust flow and citation flow. Now, if you put this into Majestic, it is a paid tool, but you can use it for free up until a certain point. And as long as the trust flow is about equivalent to the citation flow, that tells us that that's a good site. Now, you can also see external backlinks, referring domains, and we can also see if this site is a site that is a spammy site. You definitely don't want to get a backlink from a site that has been spammed because that will actually hurt you as well. But if you scroll down, you can see anchor text. We can see most of the anchor texts are YouTube. But if you start seeing anything like Chinese symbols or any type of foreign language symbols like Chinese symbols, that means typically that they are spam like crazy, especially if the site is not Chinese. If the site is Chinese and it has Chinese symbols, great. If it has other symbols, other language symbols, then of course it is probably spam, Russian or anything like that, when the site itself is not that case. So that's just something to keep in mind. If the language that is on the website and the anchor text here is a totally different foreign language, then I would steer clear of getting a backlink from that particular site. So we're not going into too much depth here, but those are just some basic things to look for. So I would plug this in here, take a look at it, and see uh, if that site is a good site to get a link back from. Now, you can also get links from other sites as well. If you're a local site, then you might want to get links back from local sites, like local directories, like Yelp. So another thing is directories. Directories, sites with categorized links. And you can link this directly here, or you can also link them directly here. And you can link these links to this link and link it back here. So, but I typically, the backlinks that you can generate back here, uh, you want to kind of keep them one step away from your money site or your money video. Now with YouTube videos, it's a little bit different. You, with YouTube videos, you can hammer it with a lot of backlinks. And then from that YouTube video within the description, you can link them to the money site. And that, that will actually help your ranking because YouTube is, has such a high authority that essentially what it does is it creates a buffer.